Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salama ala khairul mursaleen. Muhammad al-Nabi al-Ummi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'allamtana innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasil li amri wa ahla luqtata min lisani yafqahu qawli. It's really, it's really an honor to be here at this conference that is, alhamdulillah, sponsored by uh, IOK, uh, Qalam Institute, and Yaqeen. I mean, when it's a beautiful model. I hope to see more of this in our community where, where giant organizations come together and do a project of this nature together. It's a really beautiful, be beautiful conference, and I just feel very honored to be here at this conference. I want to thank the organizers uh, for, for doing this. Thank you so much. One of the things that I was just reflecting on even as I was sitting there listening to the earlier session was uh, how every word that was being said by different speakers just felt soothing to the heart to listen to. And how just how amazing it is that two days can be different. Like yesterday is not like today. You know, this moment that you're sitting here is not like another moment, you know, on a different day. And I think uh, you know something that dawned upon me is months of planning and organizing and thinking and discussing happen behind the scenes so that a community of Muslims of believers hopefully can come together and remember God together in, in, in an almost like a retreat like atmosphere um, and for that reason there's this you feel this blessing in what's being said in the time in the sentences um, and so really treasure today. It will be over before you know it. The whole, the whole conference will be over and tomorrow morning you're going to wake up and you're going to say, SubhanAllah, that happened yesterday. So really enjoy uh, the gathering and, and make as many good intentions as you possibly can to come away from this with as much benefit, hopefully, and as much reward and nearness to Allah and the pleasure of Allah from this gathering um, as, as possible. And with that, uh, you know, I was given the topic um, do we need feminism? That's, so the answer really is no. <laughs> and I'm done with my talk. No, I'm joking, but it's a, um, it's a charged topic. I actually don't have, I have only 20 minutes to talk about it, uh, and I have material that could last hours on this topic. And so, you know, may Allah allow me to say what's beneficial in this context. Um, you know, before we talk about something, they say it's important to define it. What do we mean when we say the word feminism? Um, and if you ask the Sheikh Google, he says it's the advocacy of women's rights on the basis of the equality of the sexes. Wikipedia says, it is a range of political movements, ideologies, and social uh, movements that share a common goal to define, establish, and achieve political, economic, personal, and social equality of the sexes. This includes seeking to establish educational and professional opportunities for women that are equal to those of men. So those are two definitions you can find online. I was doing some research on it and I saw that there's uh, a researcher from Forbes magazine who herself is a, identifies herself as a faith-based feminist. Um, and she wanted to understand why so many people of faith, not just Muslims, but just religious people don't like this word. Why don't they identify? And so in her research, she found uh, a, cou a couple of interesting findings. She said that Religious communities believe in rights for men and women, but they have a problem with specifically the word equality, the, how the word equality is used in the, in, in the definition. The second thing that she found was that faith-based communities actually admit that there's unfair gender bias in the greater society and in their communities and that it's wrong. But the third thing that she found, which I think is really telling, and she said, in general, specific views on these issues are rooted deeply in our own personal and direct experiences rather than data and research. Whether someone identified or didn't identify, whether someone hated the word or liked the word, the factor that would be the most telling on whether or not they would was their own personal experiences that's what's actually going to shape their view on the subject. So when I reflected on myself about that, I was like, you know, actually that's very true. One of the reasons that I have such a distasteful 
um, distasteful sort of disposition towards uh, the word feminism even is because when I was 15 years old, I was taking a college class um, and the professor was identified herself as a white liberal feminist. And I remember as a 15 year old sitting through the class and constantly feeling like she was somehow saying that my religion was less or wrong or deficient because of the way that we, uh, you know, for example, wearing hijab. Um, you know, they somehow saw that as because it's not exactly equal, then, then, then it's not right. It's morally incorrect. And I remember going through that experience thinking like, you have no authority, you have no moral authority to judge what I am doing based on my divine tradition. Right, so um, that was my first experience. Other experiences that there's literally never been someone in my life who's ever told me the words, um, I, when I see women who wear that, I just want to rip it off their heads, other than white liberal feminists. I've heard it actually three times in my life by different white liberal feminists. So, so much for women's rights. I mean, to me, I, I, can't, I can't look at it without feeling a certain degree of skepticism, and not just skepticism, but more like, I. You, you don't get to judge my paradigm. Your set of you know, values that instructs what you believe to be true is completely different than my set of values. And so this is, this is my own personal experience. Now, the question that we also have to raise is, can we have a discussion about controversial issues without losing our mind? And can we except that there may be differences of opinion even within the Muslim community. And we can validate each other. And we can still be okay with each other. So I just gave you some of the reasons, and I'm gonna actually continue. But one of the things I wanna mention is, that was my story. My story was, I was growing up in this country, I wearing hijab, alhamdulillah, in public institutions, and uh, feeling that, you know, even as, as uh, Dr. Tasneem mentioned earlier, you go into an academic class about Islam and you're telling the professor things like, you know, this is not Islam. I, at 18 years old, I was I'm a religious studies major, I remember standing up in my college classroom saying, you know, if you guys want to pass the tests, go ahead and answer what the book says, but if you actually want to know about what Islam says, come to the Islam 101 class at the Masjid in San Diego. We offer it every Sunday between 12 and 1. And the teacher just looked aghast, and I was like, I'm 18, right? <laughs> Um, and it was just, you're teaching wrong things in the name of my religion. I do not take my paradigm for morality from people who don't understand my religion. And I think that's a really crucial point for young people today. When you go into a college classroom, beware of someone giving you ideas that make you hate yourself, right? Beware of someone telling you you are less than because they have some kind of moral authority over you. No, you just recognize that you're a Muslim and you have a completely different trajectory. And you can benefit. I'm not saying you can't benefit from certain things, but they are not in charge of your understanding of your, of, of your overall worldview. And one of the things to recognize also in this regard, as I said before, it's, it's personal experiences. Now, I know a woman who's a scholar in Islam, a legit, I mean, no one would, would, would question her scholarship. And she's a white convert to Islam. And she was part of the feminist movement before she became Muslim. And she often says, it is feminism that brought me to Islam. Because I was looking for women's rights. I was in charge, I was actually involved in the movement. I was at the protests. And when I started to look into women's rights, I found what Islam had to say. And I said, this is the most feminist religion in the world. <laughs> and so this, she self-identifies as a Muslim feminist or as a faith-based feminist. That's her choice. And in Arabic we say la mushahata fil istilah, which means we don't argue over terms. Right? What she means when she uses that term is the advocacy of women's rights according to the Sharia. That's what she means. So she's saying Muslim feminist, but she really means the advocacy of women's rights according to the Sharia. But if you were to just ask me, I would say well, that's just Islam. I don't, that's just Islam. I advocate for Islam. Now, again, there's a difference of opinion. And we had kind of a, um, we had a little bit of a discussion about this on a list of female teachers. And the thing that I thought was, alhamdulillah, nice in that space was there were Muslim women 
Azhari graduated, or uh, um, with studied with, have ijazat from Azhari scholars, from traditional scholars in the East, from Syria, from different places, and they're having this discussion about this subject. And we were able to differ without anyone being considered um, a sellout, anyone being considered uh, deviant, anyone being considered uh, you know, somehow ostracized from the general body of Muslims, we're having just a difference of opinion, right? And I think that sometimes these controversial issues when they exist in our community, we, the question is, can we just differ? Can we have like a good fight, you know? Like a, like a pleasant, kind, friendly disagreement that doesn't mean you're not my sister anymore or somehow you're outside of the orthodoxy, right? And so that's what I think really should be emphasized when we talk about this. What do people mean when they use this word? And again, my, my own bias is there, I, I mentioned at the beginning. Now there's a statement, I also found it online in terms of the research around Islamic feminism, and it was wisely noted, we need to start by asking some basic questions. Who's Islam? Who's feminism? Who is speaking for Islam? And who is speaking for feminism? These questions remain unaddressed in most debates, whether in academia, media, or activist forums, right? Like, who, who are we talking about? Now, as far as who's feminism, just doing a basic search, and this is not, you know, I'm not a gender studies major, but just doing some basic research on it, there's, I found at least 29 different forms. There's Amazon feminism, anarcho-feminism, cultural feminism, difference feminism, Ecofeminism, equality feminism, essentialist feminism, feminazism, feminism and women of color, first feminism, fourth feminism, French feminism, lesbian feminism, liberal feminism, Marxist socialist feminism, material feminism, moderate feminism, pop feminism, postcolonial feminism, uh, postmodern feminism, psychoanalytic feminism, radical feminism, separatist feminism, socialist feminism, third world feminism. And there are more. So when we say, like, what do you mean by feminism, there's, they, they literally have no ijma about, every, about anything. There's no consensus. There's no, like, this is what we're about, that all of them will say, yeah, that's what we're about. Because there's, there's a difference of agreement within that movement. And that's there, and they acknowledge it. One of my teachers used to say, beware of plastic words. And a plastic word is a word that means a different thing to every person who uses it. Not that it evokes different emotions, but it actually like, denotes something different according to the person who uses it. As an example, you know, different, when people are talking about, oh, this would be progress, even though progress is a general word, it can often be a plastic word because it means it, it denotes in that context something different for the person who's using it. So it's good to actually spell out what it is a person is advocating, specifically, right? With feminism, it's become like that. It's become a word that you actually cannot define definitively. Um, and there are many definitions of them. One of the things that the author, the researcher in the Forbes magazine mentioned was that faith-based communities have a problem with the word equal. Now, we as Muslims believe that spiritually, we're all created equal. We recognize that. As a, on a spiritual level, we were created equal. But it might be a little taboo to say this, but we also believe that Allah has privileged both genders. There is male privilege, and there's also female privilege. We do have patriarchy, but we also have matriarchy. There's a fadl, right? There's a fadl that's given to men in certain regards, and there's a fadl that's given to women in certain regards. And then even in the Qur'an, I can't consciously advocate for quote-unquote equal, on a social level especially, when we have the verse, وَلَيْسَ الذَّكَرَ كَالْأُنْثَى Right? And the male is not like the female. And just side comment here, the interesting thing about this verse is it doesn't say that the female is not like the male says that the male is not like the female, kind of linguistically it puts the female as the standard, just saying. <laughs> um, so so there's a, we have, there, are, there are ways that Allah has privileged women and mothers, uh, the female in general, over other, 
over, the, over, over men. And there are ways that Allah has privileged men over women, and He has made that as a compliment. If we, as women, acknowledge our own privilege, and if we, as women, honor the God-given privilege and actually advocate for those privileges, honestly, it would heal the whole society. I'm not going to ask just for my rights. I'm actually going to ask for my divine privileges. Right? So when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu uh, you know, someone comes to him and asks after Allah and his messenger, who do I honor most, right? And, the, and who's most deserving of my good company? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, your mother, your mother, your mother, and then your father. We repeat this all the time. We do, as a community, we recognize this. But how many of our institutions, the architecture, reflects any amount of respect for the mother that's trying to attend that program? Three times your mother. Where is the parents' room? Where is the mother's room? Where is the nursing room? Right? Where is the place for young people to, uh, to, to take a break and come back? Why? Because those are things a mother needs to be able to listen and benefit. So architecturally, yeah, if there's three extra rooms that are, you know, there in a space, in a religious space, to accommodate for the mother, well, that's as it should be. That's what it means to honor your mother. So, let's see. So I had a, I just want, I'm going to read the statement I put on the women's chat. Um, and I just, it, you, I want you to hear that I'm being very direct and front and forward. And the thing that I really appreciated was that there were women, female Muslim scholars who, differ, who disagreed with me and differed with me, but neither one of us questioned each other's Islam or orthodoxy or training, right? This is an area of the modern world that we're going to differ on and we need to be able to have those conversations. So I told her, I don't subscribe. The reason I could never sign on to feminism as a, on a personal level was just the idea that if you have to go outside your own theology for your human rights and dignity, what does that say about your religion? Wouldn't the way of God not only be enough, but better than a man-made movement at giving his creation all that they deserve and is good for them. God doesn't hate women. His true religion would never abuse women. His religion would bring out the best in and for all of his creation. So no, I am not a feminist, I'm a Muslim, and to me, there's no way, there's no way another ism, whatever it is, could do for me more than the way of God does. That being said, I think every Muslim woman has her own story, history, and experience. I have friends who identify as feminists and who have studied with Azhari scholars, and we accept and tolerate each other's difference and choice. And I don't, even though I don't think it's a good idea, but if others do, I don't have a need to ostracize them. Right? And so that's what I think as a community, what do we really need is we need the ability to have a conversation about these things coming from, I believe the best in you. I'm not doubting your Islam. I'm not doubting where you're coming from. And being able to actually listen to each other's stories and how they've arrived to these particular conclusions. One of the things one of my teachers taught me is a significant point. If you don't take anything else, please take this. Is that once I heard someone say some terrible things on stage, and I asked one of my teachers, in Islam, like if you're trying to be a good person, um, do you have to like everyone? And uh, my teacher said, no, you don't have to like everyone, but you have to be able to have empathy with everyone, even your enemies. And so when I actually look at feminism, and even Muslims who turn towards it, there's a lot of pain, real, valid, serious trauma and pain that this movement is a response to in different ways. Right? And within the Muslim community, I've had sisters come afterwards and say, my family would tell me that you as a woman don't have a right to study after high school, that, you, that that's the, the only education you need, you, you're not going to be allowed to go to college like your brothers, you're just going to stay home. And they felt very oppressed. And then they were online and reading about feminism, and they found feminism as sort of like their, liberal, their, their form of liberation. And the reality of that is that people are being abused in the name of Islam. Right? Women are being abused in the name of Islam. Texts are being misused against women often. And it is a real issue. Um, and even, I mean, this is another discussion, but even if you go through historical texts, some of our historical texts show that. 
like that there actually is gender bias, even in some scholarly interpretations. That doesn't mean they're not scholars. It just means that it does reflect some, some of that bias. Now, if we're going to have uh, you know, a mature conversation around this, we have to be prepared to change as a community. Like we actually have to be able to hear the, as a sister mentioned earlier, it's not just about like complaining, right? It's not, the, the purpose isn't to stand up somewhere and complain and say women are told to not come to the masjid. Come to, in California, alhamdulillah, Southern California, we tend to be better than other institutions, but I remember actually Sheikh Omar Suleiman once he talked to me about this, he said, I heard the masajid in Southern California are better than the other regions as it relates to like women's issues. And I said, yeah, but it's kind of like saying, to Palestinians, you know, in, in Israel, you know, you should, you should be happy. You're, you get to be an Arab Israeli in, in, in the, you know, Israeli government. Like, you get to be a second-class citizen. Isn't that so much better than just getting bombed all the time? You know, um, that's, that, that's, <laughs> it's, it's second-class citizenship. It's what it is when, when, when the women's musallah is this hole in the wall, or there's no speaker, or the, for whatever reason the camera's not working, or that, that overall neglect for uh, women in our community spaces, that's a reality. And so when young sisters, Muslim sisters, go into a college classroom, right, and they are being honored, per se, let's say now you have feminism for women of color, um, and they may be treated differently, it becomes a fitna because it's like, in my own community, I have talent, skills, I, I want to serve, and I get rejected from these spaces, but then I go over to the outside world that's not Muslim, and they, they welcome me, I, I, I grow in my position, in my job, or in my career, in my education. And that becomes a major uh, trial for that sister. Why is she turning to feminism? Because we're not showing her the beautiful model of Islam. And so I want to end actually with um, a statement from actually Dr. Jackson. And he makes this statement in reference to race in this country. And I'm going to actually omit the word black American and put the word gender in, and we'll see how it reads. He says, and this is in his article, Politically Speaking, Who Am I and What Do I Want as an American Muslim? He says, our problem as Muslims is not that we have commitments to different collective identities. Our problem is that we tend to treat our collective identities as if they represented ultimate truth, as if they were Islam itself, as if they were an idol through whose appeasement we derive some sense of psycho-spiritual well-being or fulfill some cosmic mission. Our collective ethnic and racial, and I would say gender, identities often sit in judgment over Islam instead of invoking Islam as judge over our ethnic and racial and gender commitments and sentiments. In this capacity, my Muslim brother or sister's Islam determines almost nothing about how I relate to, engage, or treat them, or their issues to which Islam itself might assign significance, if not priority. All too often, race and ethnicity and gender, albeit in unspoken ways, determine too much. I want to declare that my ultimate commitment is to God and the religion of Islam that Islam shall sit in judgment over my racial identity and my gender identity, not the other way around. Thus, even as I pursue the well-being of the broader black American collective, I shall commit to doing so on the basis of these values, of these values, virtues, and priorities of Islam. My blackness, and I'm not black, but his blackness and you know, my gender is neither a morality nor a statement of ultimate truth nor a path to otherworldly salvation. Islam, on the other hand, is all of these for me. In the words of Zainab al-Ghazali, she once famously said, Muslim women need to study Islam because it is through Islam that Allah has guaranteed her all her rights. Whatever is beneficial is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever is wrong and mistaken is from myself and shaitan. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum.